It has been said that average people want you to stay average. Welcome to the Breaking Average Podcast. The podcast designed to challenge you to break the mold that average has on the world. Each episode offers insights directly from those who choose to break average every day. Now, for the latest insights, here are your hosts, Paul Gustafson and Reek Morris. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Breaking Average Podcast. I'm Rick Morris, and I'm always here with my friend and co-host, Paul Gustafson. How are you doing, Paul? Hey, Rick. I am great to be here, man. It is, it's fun, man. It's always fun sitting down with you, having these conversations. And I love, I love the how-to series that we've been working through. So this has been great. It's been a lot of fun. Again, we're, we're not trying to profess of being experts. We, we said, you know, these how-to series was just for us to be able to uh, discuss our personal experiences and things that we've been through as, as a way of maybe to, to help start a conversation or help give that breakthrough to somebody who, who needed to hear it so that they too can break average. So uh, today in that same series, we wanted to talk about uh, really branding, building that personal brand, building that corporate brand, but uh, how to be remarkable within that brand as well, Paul. Yeah, I, I love this concept. I mean, Seth Godin kind of dropped this idea about being remarkable. And uh, it's such an easy phrase to say, but it's maybe not one that we we have in our vena- our vernacular um, it, because, it, I don't know, maybe it's just not in vogue or something. We don't think about being remarkable. Maybe we're a little bit too hesitant to be remarkable um, because we think that's brag- braggadocious. I don't know. But you know what? We're we're equipped to be able to make an impact on other people's lives in our businesses. And, and you know, if you're a coach, if you're a coach, a speaker, a trainer, Whatever your profession is, you're equipped to make an impact in other people's lives. So why not be remarkable? So let's talk about that. Yeah, first, I mean, I, I know you're kind of a, a word sleuth. You love to take, you know, some of these things. In fact, uh, uh, it was uh, yesterday, the day before I was looking at Facebook, and one of the quotes that I had captured for you that we were doing a podcast, one of the things you said uh, a year ago, Paul, is, is in order to be uh, incredible, you have to be credible. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember saying that, but that was yeah. one of the things that you had said right here on this podcast about a year ago. I was like, oh, that's really like, that's that's awesome. But yeah, you can't be incredible without being credible. But I know you like to break some of these words apart. Yeah. And really, so let's first discuss what it really means to be remarkable and in, in that meaning itself uh, of remarkable. Because I think sometimes we we take these words and we overuse them or we use words oh, yeah. all the time. Um, you know, as, as hashtags more so than really understanding what the words themselves mean. So let's, let's break that word down first, then we can get into the branding. Paul. Sure. Yeah. And what's great about our how to series is Rick and I are sitting down as if we're having a cup of coffee and we're just having a conversation like, Hey, Rick, you know, how, how do we do this? And we're inviting you into this conversation. He's already shared that, Hey, we don't have all the answers. Um, I don't have a dictionary in front of me right now to kind of pull on some of these things, but we can, we can pull from some of our knowledge and awareness before. So here's what I think, Rick, remarkable, shorten that word up. When we say remark, when somebody makes a remark about something, they remark about the Washington football team. They remark about March madness. They remark about the baseball season that's ongoing. They remark about a movie. All right. What do you, what do you think is happening in that moment when we remark on something? It's either good or bad, right? So think about that word remark for a second. Right? First is talking, right? Yeah, we're talking. Yeah. We're making a remark. We're making a remark. So we see remarks on Amazon all the time. The most powerful remarks that we see are reviews, right? Somebody else's analysis, uh, thought of a product, a book, uh, whatever it is that they bought. And so that's, if you look at it, we're going to read those. And the ones that get voted up are the ones that are called to us are remarkable, right? Oh, that's, I like that comment, you know? And so they actually do vote ups on that. Well, the truth of it is it really benefits the product or the service or the solution that's being sold. So the the question is, is like, okay, if, if somebody's going to remark on my business, remark on who we are and what we do, or remark on our podcast, I want want it to be remarkable, right? I, I, I really do. And that's not braggadocious. That's somebody else remarking on 
our behalf. So how do we create sustainable businesses and products and solutions that other people will remark on that allow it to be remarkable? Because it can't be me. I can't tell you that, hey, I've got something remarkable for you. I've got to have others around it who are going to remark on it. So that's what I think remarkable. That's what I think of with remarkable. How about you? Yeah, it's same. It, and it's it, interesting that you're, you're spinning up one of my early leadership things that, that I did long, before I knew I was going to be a, a public speaker or, you know, a, a, somebody that, that does what I do for a living um, goes all the way back to when I was waiting tables. Um, now I'll give the brief story that, that there was a, there was a waiter named Kader um, that worked at Casa Gallardo on International Drive in Orlando, Florida. And my dad was a very, very routine person. And so Friday night, 6 p.m., he had reservations at Casa Gallardo. If I needed to know where my dad was on a Friday night at 6 p.m., he was at Casa Gallardo <laughs> in Kader's section. We'd walk in, drinks would be on the table, the order would be put in for my dad, everything would be set just like he likes it, perfect. And Kader never wrote anything down. Um, and that always impressed my dad. And of course, you know, we, we've discussed many times on the podcast what my dad meant to me. So now I'm getting into waiting tables and that kind of stuff. And that was the first thing I decided I was going to do is I was never going to write anything down at the table. Um, I was going to listen to my customers. I was going to hear what they were saying. I was going to remember that. There's, it drives me nuts if, if you're at a table, there's only two of you. And that server comes back and goes, who had the chicken? I was like, there's only two of us. <laughs> like, you, know, you don't know. I, I just told you 15 minutes ago, you know, and, and I get it. Right. But at the same time, I think that's that level of service when we start talking about being remarkable. Mm. So I started to learn how to do that. And, and there's a lot of other stories behind that. But because I did that, I became a, a trainer. And so I was doing what we called openings uh, for Chili's. And, and what you would do is you would go to the new city, you would train everybody. But I gave this speech, um, all that lead in to tell you this speech. I used to say, look, w when you're competing for 15% of a tip, right, is your standard service. Most people say if there's good service, it's, you know, 15% tip. I said, you're being compared against every other restaurant and every other server you've ever been to. Like the, that person at the table, when they're making that decision of what to tip you, they're comparing that against every single restaurant experience they've ever been to. So what are you going to do that's going to be remarkable? What are you yeah. going to do that's going to up that level to say, I'm going to remember Paul at the Chili's in Greenville, South Carolina. Now, true story, though. Um, I used to wait tables at, at, at the Bennigan's in Orlando. It's now two year or a year and a half removed from that. I'm in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, opening up at Chili's. I'd given that speech about two days before to the, the training staff. And while we're doing the opening, we're actually waiting tables. We're, we're showing people how it's done. we got people following us. And this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, Remo, which was my nickname when I, you know, in, in Orlando. And I, I turned around, not expecting to hear that in Greenville, South Carolina. And he was like, what are you doing here? And I had no recollection of the person whatsoever. And he was like, you, you waited tables at Bennigan's in Orlando on I drive. And I was like, yes, sir. And he was like, I brought my family every night there. Um, my girls loved you. And so he brought the family in. And as soon as I saw the little girls, I remembered because I had so, I didn't remember having them for the week and had so much fun. We draw pictures together and do silly stuff at the table while they were waiting for their food. Um, but to me, that was remarkable coming back. Does that make sense? Yeah. So all that to say, the, the point being is, is even in the little things like, you know, waiting tables, how do you stand apart? And I think that that's something that, you know, when, when I read online, like if you were to search, like how to build a remarkable brand, you know, for the first things that's, they're, they're going to start telling you how to build the business. Yes. And the first thing I want you to think about is how are you going to be different than anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is great. That's a good story too. And I, I like to think, you know, Rick, by the way, that Bennigan's that you, you and I talked about several times now on iDrive. Yeah. I used to go there three, four times a week when I was visiting there, you know, the two or three times a year that I stayed at that holiday inn on international drive. And, uh, I, 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 it kind of like, well, as you were sharing, I'm just, I'm, here's the truth guys. I remember somebody who was waiting at Bennigan's and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. All this time we're doing podcasts we're get together. You and I met way back when, when I was a customer and you were waiting at Bennigan's probably. 
Who knows? I mean, that place was nuts, though, man. I bartended and waited tables there for a little over a year. So you're looking at 1991, uh, 92, somewhere around there. Okay. Somewhere yep. around there. So, yeah, I started uh, going there in 91, 92, 93, all the way to 2003. Yeah. So I don't know if there was a Could stretch be. there. Could be. We were nuts. Well, I mean, yeah. everybody's on vacation. It's Orlando. You get away with everything. Here's what's cool about Medicans. Me and my, my uh, compadre who co-founded this company right here, some mentions, we're at Bennigan's and we're, um, we're thinking like, gosh, okay, there's a need out there. We just had listened to some great talks. Um, we heard some of the, the needs that uh, the warfighters, decision makers really wanted as far as this area of modeling and simulation. And I won't get into that. But my, my compadre, Steve and I, we were like, okay, we were jazzed up, man. So after we ordered our Monte Cristo sandwiches, you know Amen. what I'm talking about, man. Amen. <laughs> okay. After we ordered our Monte Cristos, we're waiting for it. We pull out a Bennigan's napkin and we ask for more. And we, and somewhere I got to find it. We drew out like a game plan, like, okay, here's what we're going to do. And we strategize exactly what we're going to do, build this tool suite to be able to support it. And we wanted to build, and we didn't use the term then, but now that I think about it, we wanted to build something remarkable. And we ended up launching a whole business when you yeah. think about it. So, yeah. So I love this idea of being remarkable. To me, it's about being, finding that differentiation. How do you differentiate yourself, right? The businesses, the coaches, whoever you are, whatever size you are, the difference maker is how do you differentiate yourself from everybody else? And that's, Essentially, what you're talking about, Rick, is differentiation. So what we talk about, like when you're pursuing something, a new opportunity, okay, there's a need out there. You can comply to that need. You can say, yes, I can help you with this, which is good. You've got to. You've got to be compliant. Compliance, good. But compliant is average, people. And we want you to break average. What you need to be is compelling compelling and compliant. So that's really the, the take that I would have with that is find ways to be not just compliant, but compelling. And it can be just small little things. You know, um, here's one. I was reading about a, a business, a well-known business, and I won't um, advertise who it is. And here's what they do for their hiring process, which I thought, oh my gosh, that's remarkable. So when they, when they set up interviews with folks, They'll have that initial intake kind of conversation, you know, uh, just quick connect, usually like a, a Zoom or a WebEx, which is great. That's good. But what they do, rather than the HR, the head of HR being the, the hunt down person trying to make it all work, um, the HR person's there and they're perfect and, and they're remarkable in their, in their own right uh, if, if, if it's a legitimate business. But what's really cool is that the hiring manager really has the play. And this is different than what most businesses, at least corporate America does. Most corporate America type businesses, what they do is they let the HR person kind of play it all the way to the end and nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of the, the status quo. But when you can get the manager in play, like say, hey, um, just wanted to, for example, let's say the offer, you're ready to give an offer to somebody and you want them to join your team. Typically, an HR guy would say, okay, cool. I'll get the offer letter out to them. Okay, great. Let the HR team create the offer letter, but you deliver the message. If you're the hiring person, why not you be the per You make that contact. Say, hey, really enjoy contacting with you. Our HR team um, has, a, has an offer letter that I want to offer to you or I want to share with you. And uh, I want to answer any questions you have. We would love to have you on our team. Show that show that element. It's just a little, little touch, a little change there that may be different than most processes within business, but it is a really, a, I think a compelling approach. And I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. And they had a bunch of other examples, but that's just one. So what are some ways, Rick, let's talk about this. What are some ways that you, you know, choose to be remarkable? Yeah, there, there's multiple things that when I decided to open up R squared, um, there was a there was a need as well, just like you were saying with Simventions. Um, I had just uh, uh, helped with the purchase of, of a, a software system by a major you know uh, manufacturer, 
And my job was to be the, the project manager of the first implementation. I remember, I'll say who the implementation was for because I, I love them to death, but it, absolutely my worst implementation in, in my life period was Saks Fifth Avenue. So they actually have uh, their headquarters at the time is in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so we, it, it, you wouldn't think that either, right? But yeah. all of IT for, for Saks wow. Fifth Avenue is in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, <laughs> so you go over to, to, to Jackson and, and I'm just supposed to be 10% allocated as the project manager, just making sure everything's moving on through. And the partner gets fired and okay. we didn't have anybody else to put on it. And so uh, the company was like, well, you do it. You, you do the configuration. And I'm, I was comfortable to a point, but not the lead one, right? And yeah. um, but anyway, I, I I did it. And the next one I saw the partner get fired, they asked me to do it. And I was like, okay, there's a huge issue here with that partner center. Um, so the first thing I did was really research the, the financial side of it, how I was going to do it and try to figure out how did I want to price? And everybody was pricing the same way. So everybody, and it's no different than you see shoes or you know, coats or things like that, right? There's a median price that people are expecting to pay. And uh, you've got to decide, you know, what, what you're going to charge. And I just looked at the whole process and did a deep dive, deep study. I, I studied how many people were um, generally on the teams, how many people um, participated in it, how long things went, all that stuff. And I came up with my pricing. And my pricing um, and I'll just say it because I'm, I'm really not doing this side of the business anymore. Um, but most of the people uh, did this for 170 an hour. That's that was what they did. I charged 250 an hour, um, and I did that on purpose. And I would love my favorite question I would get asked in any sales cycle whatsoever is, "Why are you 250 an hour and somebody else is 170?" So first of all, to be remarkable, you want to create. Yeah. A, a question in their mind that you can answer that you're prepared yeah. for. And I said, you know what? I'm so happy that, that you asked me that question. First, I'll, I'll give you three reasons. Number one, um, everybody that I hired in my company is a former executive, CIO, CFO, COO. I'm bringing you C-level executives, which you know require that level. However, um, I have two people on our teams that do implementation. Everybody else has four. Um, so if you really do the math, four times 170 versus two times 250, I'm actually cheaper than they are, but I'm bringing higher level thinking and higher level experience to you. But we're also way more efficient and so much so that I would be the one doing your implementation. And so everything I'm learning right now through this whole pre-sales cycle, every time you and I get together, every time we talk, I'm learning about what it is that you want. Ask those people that are in the pre-sale cycle who's actually going to be on site when you sign this contract because you're going to have to pay them twice as much to spin them up for them to be able to transfer all this knowledge that they learn. And they're not going to transfer it well. We all know how that works, right? You've been through these cycles before. Yeah. So the two things that are, are really different about us is me and him, the two people you see right here in the sales cycle, we're the ones that are going to be doing the implementation. Second of all, we're twice as efficient. Third of all, we cost less per hour than they do in every single meeting and every single hour of implementation. So that's why we're, we're priced where we are. Dude, lock, stock, and barrel. They already liked us at that point to even ask us that question. They were already considering us to even ask that question, and that's how we would close the sale. Yeah. Uh, and there's something important to be said that Rick's talking about, guys. I know everybody everybody's been in that position rick you too right hesitant to, to to talk price hesitant to to put that out there because we don't want that to um be the barrier to having that connection and that relationship built right initially and yet <clears throat> we're doing a disservice to them and to ourselves when we bottom line our price okay we are we're, we're, we're how can we be remarkable if we come down, uh, if we undervalue our worth, we just can't do it. And that's not fair to them either. And this happens in our industry too, right? You see businesses who want that proposal. They, 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 they go after it, which is great. It's good. You should. Um, and they submit a bid that is vastly cheaper than the other competitors. And then the selection committee behind it you know, best value. Well, what does that mean? Right? So the selection committee will make a decision and uh, it depends upon how they're really kind of tuned. And I won't get into that, but sometimes what happens is that low bidder wins. And when that low bidder wins, okay, it hurts not to win it. And maybe you priced, you, you, you provided a price that was a little high, but 
and you find out later, yeah, we, we, we were way, we priced ourselves way over everybody else. However, watch what happens. Uh, I was going to call it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Watch what happens because I have seen this time and time again, and it doesn't stop. It's like, stop the insanity people. All right. A business that underbid and won the contract can never perform on that contract. Nope. They just can't. And it is so frustrating to see that because you see it. And even your technical uh, customers, they saw it too, but there was a whole bidding team behind it in terms of evaluating those bids. And they're like, oh, well, we just got to go. We got to go with what, who's cheapest. Mm -mm, no. And then what invariably happens, a couple of things. Sometimes there is a, um, I've seen it where the contract just gets pulled. They're like, wait a minute. No, <laughs> we're redoing this reset whole new contract a year out. Uh, the, that, that team that won it is gone the incumbent. Now they're no longer. So <clears throat> it, there's a lot of different plays that happen. The other one is that there's a, um, an extension that's added. There's, there's. Oh yeah. Change effort. request to death. Yeah. yeah. It's just crazy. It's not good. Don't do it folks. Don't underbid. All right. Be remarkable and you'll be sought after. You will be sought after. And I know sometimes you're not going to get the get the win that you want. The It's going to happen. But maybe that's not a customer that you really wanted to serve ultimately in the first place. Why? Because they didn't want to really pay for that remarkable service. So be remarkable. Set that high. Set that bar high for yourself. Have that high expectations deliver on what you promise. I'm telling you, if you deliver on what you promise, over deliver, maybe you'll be remarkable hands down. Yeah. So I'll just pause there. I'll let you kind of chew on that. Oh, no, I mean, you, you spun up so many things in, in my brain. It's great. First of all, um, I, I'll, I'll give you two quick stories of, of either side, but it was spawned by Seth Godin. We were, we were together and listening to Seth and Seth asked a question that he's very famous for asking is, are you, are you an entrepreneur? Or are you a freelancer? And he's like, if you're an entrepreneur, you go out and you basically hire people and get out of the way. That's what you do as an entrepreneur. That's how you build a business. Um, if you're a freelancer, which is you're charging time for money, which I was, he said, for you to hit your financial goals, the only thing you need to do is go get better clients. Now, I love when somebody says something that succinctly and there, but at the time, yeah. I was working, again, this is one of the hardest lessons for an entrepreneur to, to learn is that not all revenue is good revenue. Yeah. So I had accepted a fixed price contract. I got pushed down on my rate. I thought I needed that thing and they were driving me crazy. And I actually got a few moments with Seth and we got a chance to talk to him. And Seth told me to fire that client. Mm. And I did. And within about um, probably four weeks later, I had a client that was way better, way worthy of my time and paid me my rate. And I didn't really lose any revenue, right? It was a scary thing. But this, the tale of two sides there is number one, the one that was constantly pushing me down, trying to get more for their money, trying to do all that. I couldn't stand them, didn't want to work for them. I wasn't giving them my best. I certainly yeah. wasn't being remarkable. Yeah. Now flip that to my favorite contract of all time. That one is where they asked me about my rate. I said, you know what? Uh, my rate is my rate. And I know you guys have tried to do this before. I'm telling you we can do it. Um, but here's what I'll do is I'll share the risk with you. And I don't know why I even came up with this, Paul. I said, but I'll share the risk with you. So what I'll do is I'll accept a lower rate for every hour as we deliver. But when my team does what they say they can do, when they say they can do it, you're going to pay me the difference at that point. So I'll withhold that on the, so at, at that point, we were like 250 an hour. We said, you know what? I'll take 200 an hour. But the moment we deliver what we're supposed to deliver, you're going to pay me $50 an hour every hour that we bill. And if we don't, then, then we're both out that, right? I mean, then, then we're sharing this risk here. Yeah. Um, they actually came back and taught me something. They came back and they said, you know what? You do that, we'll pay you $75 an hour for every hour. Then if you deliver it within this range, 50, within this range, 35, and within this range, you're just going to stay at 200. And I was like, deal. And we hit it at that 275, right? So yeah. they incented us. Now that project, everybody was jamming together. Super good solutions. Anytime there was a problem, we got on the phone. Everybody was working together, making quick decisions, moving that path forward because they were yeah. financially incented. And so were we. That's the tale of two sides there. But to finish this, and I'll kick it back over to you. 
the worst thing from an integrity perspective and was the hardest thing to sell and the biggest thing for me to learn was dealing with those people that I knew was bidding too low, that I knew was going to change requests. So I would call it out. I would say that's their price. I would bet my price that they're going to change request you at some point. And you don't have to believe me or not, but when they do, when they present you with that change request, I want you to think of me. Is it how I would sell against that? But what I developed at that point, and it's in my book, um, uh, Stop Playing Games, I developed a fixed price per activity. I never would give a fixed price, ever. What I would do, though, was fixed price and activity. So if you think in a standard project or in standard service, every, the activities are pretty much the same. What the variability is, is how many of those you do. Right. So you if you write a line of code, you write a line of code, you build a simulation, you build a simulation. The tasks that you're doing is relatively the same. The complexity and the number of tasks is what changes. So I had a best case, most likely worst case. So that would handle my complexities and the number of activities. So I would turn around and say, if you customer are willing to to fix the number of activities, I'm willing to fix the price and will agree to the scale. So then if you ask me for more activities, the price goes up. If you ask me for less activities, the price goes down, but we've established the pricing in a fixed price way. So we all know that. I've gotten more contracts that way than anything, but also 10, uh, probably uh, 99% of the time we come under what I projected in that fixed price per activity. So they're feeling that additional value when we're done. That's my biggest tip for you is fixed price per activity versus fixed price. Yeah, it's good. <clears throat> this is good stuff, guys. We hope you're taking notes. We love to hear from you. You know, definitely visit us at breakingaverage.com and uh, share your thoughts on this. But we want you to be remarkable in what you do. And I'm going to give uh, share some thoughts here, Rick, and love to hear your thought on this. I talked about differentiation a moment ago, and that's what you and I have been talking about. And so, as we've contemplated this, and, and I think a lot of your business as well and, and what you do, I think there's three elements to it. And maybe there's four. The first one is, what's the need of the customers? What do they need? What do they want? Maybe is a better question. What do they want and need? All right. So think about those businesses that have really been remarkable, that have changed the game, that have offered something different that nobody else had whether it's a Chipotle or Chick-fil-A or, 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 you know, we can name a number of different restaurants, even Starbucks themselves. I mean, coffee, seriously? I mean, we've had coffee since the beginning of time, it seems, and yet Starbucks found a way to differentiate themselves in that business. How did they do that? How did Chick-fil-A differentiate themselves from McDonald's and Burger King and Hardee's and Arby's and all those other fast food restaurants? How did Chipotle... I mean, think about it. Quick serve food. It's kind of like fast food, but it's not, right? How do they differentiate themselves? So what you do is you look for what the needs are. What do people want? What do they really need? Maybe they don't know they need it, right? So Henry Ford said, you know, if I gave people what they wanted, I would have given them, you know, found a way to give them a faster horse. Well, what we did was we, cre- they, we created a car, an automobile, right? Once they saw it, They're like, yeah, that's what I really need. I need that. The second thing that I think is really important is to really understand what it is that you can offer. What are your strengths, your capabilities, your skills? You've got something here that's unique. What is it? Where are you strong at? What do you value? What are you passionate about? Take time to identify that. This is really critical, guys. Think about what it is that you can offer. You were placed on this earth for a reason. You, your team, have value. What is that value? Think about how you can add that value. All right. So the third thing, this is the part that most businesses really kind of forget, right? So we talked about what the needs are, the wants. We talked about what we can bring skills and all that. But the third bit, the third bit is so huge. What is the market missing? What's not out there? What are the competitors not have? All right. What do they not have? Because we're talking about differentiation, right? So if we just hit what it is that they need and what it is that we can offer, that's pretty status quo, to be honest with you. And do it well and you differentiate. But if you really want to differentiate, hit the things that nobody else does, that nobody else does. And if you can do that, boy, you can stand out. We've we've talked about Seth Godin, I don't know how many different times. What's interesting about Seth Godin is 
he he's offered things that nobody else has. He's bringing to bear into the sharing the marketplace things that nobody else has, right? And so he's filling that niche, right? He's filling that that area that nobody else. You think about the restaurants that we just mentioned. They they saw something that nobody else had, and they're like, you know what? We we can step into that. We can figure this one out. You look at um, I was watching uh, how the food that built America. Have you ever, have you seen that series? No. Uh-uh. Phenomenal to watch. And the food that built America, you can, you see um, what Subway did, for example, and how they were competing against Blimpies and uh, really how they differentiated themselves and in, in understanding like, well, wait a minute, we can come up with a way to, to, to have a bread baked and make sandwiches on the fly in front of everybody. They were the Chipotle's before there was Chipotle's. If it wasn't for Subway, there wouldn't be no Chipotle's, my take. Right. But what they did is they found, OK, here's here's what we can do. Uh, same with uh, Pizza Hut, uh, Domino's, all those all those businesses that really made a difference at that point. But the problem is, Rick. Here's the problem. Those businesses get stale over time, don't they? Yeah. Right. So they came up with something that differentiated themselves, but then they stopped. They stopped innovating and we should never stop innovating so i'll leave it at that i know i've shared a lot but i'll let you t- kind of take it from there no yeah it, it's interesting that you said that because um even like i just said that yeah i was probably one of the number one implementers of of this certain product in the world for about three years but i knew that wasn't going to last i knew i wasn't building my business because that cycle was that software was going to start to get stale new software was going to come into the market and so what i've always focused on is the concepts that i was working on not necessarily the software but the concepts that the software was trying to solve because no matter what there's always going to be that that you know shiny thing it's almost like uh, if if you ever follow technical certifications like back in the day it was ccie like when the for internet was first coming out it was cisco certified internet uh, uh, expert or not internet expert, but I, uh, industrial engineer, something engineer. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, the, the CCIE was the big one. Then the huge one after that was MCSE, Microsoft certified, uh, yep. uh, engineer as well, systems engineer. And, uh, now those certifications, you know, the PMP was big for a long time, project PMP. management professional. Um, Agile but yeah, Scrum. Yeah, yeah. But now all these things, you know, they just dissipate over time because things keep changing. Even um, even if you look at uh, the, the fact that Agile is so big, but really Six Sigma was the precursor to Agile. ISO was the you know precursor yeah. to Six Sigma. Yeah, you know, DQM before that, right? I mean, they, all these things just keep building on each other. So it's that differentiation that, that taking something and making it slightly better. You said um, do something that nobody's ever really done before, but it's also doing it in a different way, which is what like Uber did and what, what, you know, VRBO is doing or what uh, Airbnb is doing these things. They're, they're taking a concept that, that exists, but doing it in a slightly different way that nobody else has, has ever thought of. That's huge. Um, I think my other uh, tip in this uh, area is in order to be remarkable and for someone to remark, they have to be able to tell a story. What's the story? Yeah. What story are they going to tell? And th- that comes back to what you were saying in in terms of um, uh, making sure that uh, uh, they, they can remark, that they, they can say something about you. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to, to Seth as well, though, because Ray said, you know, uh, uh, the whole purple cow thing that, that he did. Yeah. One of the things that turned out to be a mistake that that ended up being a great moment on stage always for me was my logo. So my logo is actually designed, if you look at the R squared logo and you can find it, you know, on the web or really, you know, everywhere, just, you know, look, look at R squared consulting, but my logo is a wolf and it was always intended to be a wolf. Um, and I have an old coin, uh, an old Roman coin that has um, uh, the, the mythical she-wolf, right? La Lupa, the mythical she-wolf that nourished Romulus and Remus to health, right? And built Italy uh, and Rome, they built Rome uh, together, the twins. And so I'm Italian. That that's my heritage. So I had yeah. that. I wanted the R squared logo around that. When the designer originally took that and gave it to me, it made the tail really, really bushy on the wolf. And I left it because people were like, "Is that a wolf? Is that a horse? What kind of dog is that?" It was. It was just enough of a of a detail that a lot of people would ask the question. So I would always have my logo up on stage, and I would just be talking. And inevitably, somebody would ask, 
what is my logo? What does it mean? And R squared was named after my kids, Ramsey and Remo. The logo itself, right, is I'm Italian. I'm protecting my family. My kids are in the center. That's what I'm doing it for. The swoosh around it meant I was the only person certified uh, in the world at the time end to end in project management. I can tell that story later. But like every little detail had a reason that I could tell a story. And that story would stick with more people than anything else. When they saw the logo, they knew immediately it was about my family if they heard the story. And if they saw the logo and didn't know the story, they're like, what is that? They wanted to know. It was enough of a differentiation that they would want to ask what it meant. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that story. And and it just, here's what hits me, Rick. Everything that we do, we should ask the question, how can we be, be, how can we be remarkable in what we do with in that area? How can we be remarkable in the emails that we might put out there? How can we be remarkable in the branding that we do, the logos that we create, the, the, the information that we share, the, the thought messages that we put out? How can we be remarkable in the way we connect with others? How can we be remarkable in the way we give? And I love what also comes to mind is Adam Grant years ago, he wrote a book called Give and Take and I had a chance and we'll have to pull that. It's a great interview. I had a chance to sit down with him when he first came out with that book. And he wasn't quite as as well known as he is today, but he's still a great guy. I've had several conversations with him. And but I remember him, it's just how humble he was, just that conversation. And he asked this question. It was Barry Smith and I interviewing him. And uh, he, he asked us a question about what was compelling about his book. And we kind of shared some of the thoughts that we have. And he goes, I appreciate you sharing that because I'll be honest with you, after I wrote it, <clears throat> after I wrote it, I wanted to rewrite it. I felt like I missed some things. I didn't get it right. <clears throat> but I think maybe that's part of life right? There are elements of it where we do our very best and we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily feel like we, we, we hit it out of the park, but we tried our best. And sometimes if we try our best, that is what we need to, to really add the value that we need to do. And we have to be comfortable with the fact that we gave our very best. And if we, at the end of the day, we can ask ourselves that question, did I give my best? then we should sleep well that night. And then the next day, it's an opportunity for us again. But kind of pulling back on another thought though, and and maybe I'll tie back more Adam Grant stuff, but the long game guys, you're not in the short game anymore, all right? If you really wanna be remarkable, start playing the long game. You know, Simon Sinek calls it the infinite game. It's so easy to get focused on the the real near-term stuff and try to, we think, okay, let's be remarkable with that. And yeah, okay, yes, be remarkable with that. But think about the long play effect. Like how do you continually improve? Chick-fil-A is not the same Chick-fil-A that you remember 10 years ago. They continually go through a process, all right? Chipotle is in a stage where they are trying to reinvent themselves. They just came out with a new chicken dish, for example. And what they do is they build that into their model. They didn't have it there for a while. They kind of got stale. Their competitors, Kodobas, totally stale, right? They're losing edge. Another business that thought they could compete with Subway is pretty much out of business. But they were phenomenal initially. They were putting Subway to shame initially. But they didn't reinvent. And that's Quiznos, right? I don't know. Is there a Quiznos in your town? Yeah. So like Quiznos is like, I, I haven't seen one in, in the Washington DC area in probably 10 years. So <clears throat> what we're noticing is a difference there, right? So you got to play the long game. So on, and this whole area, finally off the Adam Grant part, um, give and take, be a giver, be a giver. If you can find a way to really give, add value in your business, then you're going to be remarkable and you're going to get those remarks that you need. So those are some of my thoughts. So let's uh, close this down, man. Tip and challenge. You want to, you ready for that? Yeah, go for it. I want you, I want to hear yours. All right. So yeah, I've shared a lot here, guys. Thank you for uh, just watching and being a part of this. And I'm thinking about Rick, 
really what we're doing here with the Breaking Average podcast. And we're, we're really challenging folks in a way that I think they need to be challenged. We're challenging ourselves, right? And so I think that's the tip, the tip that I wanted to share is challenge yourself. Challenge yourself to be remarkable, just to be a little bit more impactful in what you do and the value that you add. Think about the needs that are out there. I talked about the three elements of differentiation before. What are the needs? What is it that you offer? And what's missing out there in the marketplace? What's missing? Because there are things missing. There's gaps that need to be filled and maybe you're the one to fill it. So think about those three things. That's my, my tip and challenge. Over to you, man. Yeah, the, the number one tip is to show up, it is to show up, be present. But I'd like to focus on practical differentiation. Um, and what I mean by that is really understand the why behind all of your decisions in your business so that you can explain them. Why are you priced that way? Why did you choose this model over that model? And, and I feel like most of the contracts that I ever won, um, especially like, again, when, when it, I think I won most of my contracts when it came to the pricing and it, there was those two levels. Number one, was why I chose the, the hourly rate I chose. And number two, why I decided to do a fixed price per activity versus give them a fixed price or a lump sum or, or guarantee things or that kind of stuff, because it built trust. It, it, it began to build trust that if I'm going to think through in detail how I priced and what I priced, then what do you think I'm going to do with the contract once I get it? Right. Yeah. I mean, does, does that make sense? It's like that's your opportunity to show your differentiation is in how well you thought through each one of those stages of the pitch, that kind of stuff. I, I remember um, I remember one of the biggest contracts I ever won. Um, we go in and I'm competing against the the, the big boys like it, it was Deloitte. It was, you know, Ernst and Young. And then this little podunk firm, R squared, with four people out of Alabama. You know, what I mean, it's really, and, and I mean, this is, and yeah. literally, the the prices um, were three and a half million, seven and a half million, and I I priced eight hundred seventy five thousand dollars. And of course, they pounced on me, and they were like, "There's no way, you know, the guy's small; they can't handle business your size." Blah blah blah. And so when it came to the pricing defense, I was like, "Well." What you're asking for has only been done one time in the market ever. It's been one, done once in the market. Deloitte didn't do it. Ny didn't do it. These guys didn't do it. We did it. You're about four times the size of what we delivered that product for. So I multiplied that cost by four since I'm the only one that's coming in with how long it actually took. Everybody else is guessing and everybody else is trying to figure out how much money they're going to leave on the table. I easily could say, you know what, you're right, come in at 1.5 million, be under the, the lowest bill, bidder and, and come after it, but that's not who I am. This is what I think it'll take. And if you trust us, we'll do it for you. If not, that's fine. Here's how that went. They didn't trust us. They went with the bigger firm, spent $1.7 million, didn't deliver, came back to us. We did it for $775. So oh, man, that's that's just the story that you continue to build. And now those people that I did that for 775 for became that reference point for that next contract. When somebody's like, there's no way you can do it for this. Remarkable. Call them. That's how it, that's how you build it. But it's those details staying true to who you are and really coming after it and not playing the game. Like if I came in with one five, I wouldn't be able to tell yeah. you or justify how I came up with one five. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah, that's good. That's a remarkable story. And, and w you hit something there early on. I wrote some notes down. Know your why. 100% agreed. Uh, know your why. And Rick, what I believe is when you know your why, you're more confident, right? Out of doubt. Yeah. You're more confident in yourself. You're more trustworthy. You trust yourself better. Like if you don't know your why, you're going to come, you're going to waffle. <laughs> and we've all been there, guys. Look, don't beat yourself up if you've been in that situation. Let but me challenge fine. you. Hang, I, I didn't mean to yeah. cut you off there, but no, let no. me challenge you with that. One of the biggest things to know your why of is why do I want this particular contract? Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Why is it important? Why do you want it? Why is it? Why is it you add the value? Know your strengths. Why is it that you uh, should go after? But the the knowing the why is so critical. I think that's important. In fact, I had captured that earlier um in in my notes and and then you hit it again that just the importance of that and that trustworthy factor because you're going to trust yourself better 
they're going to trust you better. Um, so I think that's critical. That's going to help you be remarkable. Think about, and we've talked about him several times now, Seth Godin. Do you think he knows his why? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Think about all the businesses, individuals, entrepreneurs, speakers, whatever size, doesn't matter. The ones that stand out, the one thing that you'll see, the common denominator that allows them to stand out is they know their why. And maybe, maybe just we, we ought to spend more time trying to think about what our why is too. So that's, that's really what hit me when you shared that, Rick. And I love that story that you shared. That's good. Thank you, partner. Well, again, another yep. phenomenal, phenomenal topic here on Breaking Average. If you want to hear something about how to or even have ideas for our next season, please let us know. Hit us up on social media. Visit us at breakingaverage.com. Um, otherwise, we're going to see everybody right here on YouTube, Empowered Living, or your favorite podcast network. We'll be with you next week, Paul. Thank you for listening to the Breaking Average podcast. If you loved what you heard, please take a moment to subscribe. All opinions and comments expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not reflect the opinions or views of any of the advertisers, producers, or platforms. This show was produced by R Squared Multimedia. A special thank you to Milestone Melodies for our theme music. As you continue your day, what is one action that you can apply from this podcast to your life? Tune in for our next episode as we continue to challenge everyone to break average. <laughs>